My name is Darren. <coughs> so I'm going to walk you through three axes and then through four axes in fusion. Um, the idea being well, we're going to take a simple piece of geometry and we're going to write a couple of paths um, that will cut them out in a way that's very, very simple really. Um, so the idea is we've got a bit of stock and we're going to chop the stock out and make sure that what we drew is what we got when we cut it. Okay, so I'm going to go backwards from this. I'm going to delete the machining and show you how I got this from Rhino into here and then go through the cam operation from scratch. Right, so I'm going to delete that setup for now. Oops, got to close that menu down. All right, so there's no machining operations inside here. I'm going to delete the part from here. I'm going to close this file. and delete it from there and I'll walk you through getting it back in here. All right, now remembering that uh, Fusion uses an online shared drive, which initially you thought so, that's not great. <coughs> Actually, it's fantastic because it means that no matter where you are, you've got access to what you're working on and your teams can work on it. All right, so I drew that part up in Rhino just because I'm more used to drawing in Rhino than I am in Fusion. To get it into Fusion, you can export it as IGS or STP. I haven't seen an advantage of the one way over the other. So I'm going to grab the part. <coughs> I'm going to hit export. Select IGS as my export method. And you can see that I've done it once already. So just give it a name. I've saved it on my desktop. And then come into Fusion. So in Fusion, inside your default project or inside a new folder that you create for your project, um, you need to upload it. You're going to be running around file and open and import. You're looking for an import. It doesn't work like that. Its version of import is upload because all your files are in the cloud. All right. So from directly inside of your project, you can click upload. Otherwise, you can go to file and click upload from there. It's exactly the same thing. All right. So it brings up this little thing. Select your file. I'm after the file we just made, 3-axis IGS. And I'm going to upload it. And give it a tick to do its thing. It doesn't really take that long. And like I said, again, the advantage is massive because your entire team can be working inside you. You send them the file, the next guy does the pathing, you look at the pathing, and neither of you have to sit and copy files back and forth with each other. All right. So <clears throat> once you've got the file inside here, it's busy generating a preview thumbnail if it can. You want to bring it into your project. So just double click it. It'll pop it through into your document. All right, I'm not going to get too, day, too deep into the UX for... I'm going to close out a few of the other projects. And close that one out. And just have this one open. So the UX for Fusion, there's millions of YouTube videos. That's how you rotate the mouse and how you zoom in and zoom out, etc. But your default view is broken down on the left hand side up the top here. You're either designing something, you're rendering something, you're animating it, you're doing simulations on it to check stress or whatever. Well, in our case you're doing some manufacturing. You're going to be doing some CNC. All right. So assuming we didn't have to do any other work on this part and we're just ready to start the CNC part of it, you flip down from design, you go straight into, uh, <coughs> straight into manufacture. Now this is a very simple part because this is a very simple video. As you're aware, things can get complicated really quickly depending on how many accesses you have, how detailed the part is. But I'm going to, for this video, assume we've got a 10 millimeter tool, a uh, flat end mill that's going to give us a beautiful flat surface. Um, but of course, a 10 millimeter tool is not going to get into that gap. So we're going to swap over to a 3 millimeter tool to cut out the inside of that stuff. All right. So you'll see you've got setups. We're going to, you can either go create new setup, all right, um, with a setup sheet, or you can just start adding milling operations. As you add the milling operation, it'll dynamically generate a setup for you. It's important that you go in and double check that setup, because as far as Fusion is concerned, it doesn't care that this thing is not exactly on Z0. I specifically moved it in Rhino 
so that it was a little under Z, all right, so that I can explain how all of that works for you. You've got to be a little careful after you've got the setup generated that it's the correct setup. So what we want to do for the first thing is we're going to use a 10 millimeter tool and we're going to face this flat off because let's imagine this was a piece of wood and you've put it down on the table. The fact of the matter is it's a piece of wood, it's not flat. All right, and we want some high precision cuts inside it. So we're first going to face this so that it's beautifully flat. Then we're going to come in and cut the other parts. So <coughs> facing, oddly enough, is called facing in most cam. All right, you can find it in 3D and in 2D. Wherever you can use the 2D version, because we're working in 2D at the moment, we're just cutting a flat thing. We're not cutting any depth. So we're going to start with the facing operation. So I'm going to click face in this case. Um, and I've got to select a tool. So this is broken down by the tabs you have to follow from left to right, which is similar in a lot of cam. All right, so I want to select a 10 millimeter. Because I've been here before, you'll see that they're up at the top. Oh, they weren't, just to call me a liar. So I'm going to search 10 millimeter tool, see if it's got any default ones in its library. Most of the time it will have. So we're looking for that 10 millimeter flat end mill over there. All right, so I'm going to grab that guy. And you can see that it's too big to get in there, but the bigger a flat end mill is, the better your surface is going to be when you when you cut a surface. An end mill with a very small point is going to leave lots of fine lines across the surface. If you if you're not dead 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 straight or the part flexes or anything, generally the bigger the tool you can get away cutting with, the better off you are. All right. Um, okay, so we've now selected a tool for it. You don't need coolant for this, so I'm going to disable it. All right, And it's got a bunch of presets for different materials. Uh, I'm unsure whether you can download more or not, but you've got copper, brass, aluminium, plastics. Presumably, <coughs> it's got a very active online community. I'm sure you'll find woods and all kinds of stuff inside there. All right, so I'm going to just, I'm going to use plastics finishing for now. So on the assumption you're using this tool and you are cutting a plastic, it's suggested the feeds and speeds your tool should be moving at. Now, this is very, very helpful. It is very helpful because trying to work out these numbers on your own can be fairly difficult. All right. Um, so I'm going to switch coolant to disabled again. Because I selected plastic, it turned on my coolant pump. When you cut in plastics, you need coolant. Um, now we're going to start selecting. So we finished with the tool, we finished with the speeds. Okay, we're going to move over to the next tab. What's the what's the contour of the stock? So I'm going to select that. It's by default. You can see the yellow line as it found the model and said, I'm going to just face whatever I can find inside that yellow line. If that's not what you were after, and let's say this section was part of a much bigger model, you'd come in to select nothing. And as you see, as I'm moving my mouse around, it's highlighting different things that you can face. One we're looking for is that top one there. Now it's a little bit widgety played with your mouse. So we've now selected that this is where I want to do the facing. All right. Um, tool orientation will cover in fourth axis. In three axis cutting, by default, your Z is pointing up. All right. Um, <clears throat> so you've got a couple of things that you can either type in over here or quite handily they've given they've given a, a way to do it by just dragging the parts around. Now if you know that your tool needs to move to different safe distances, you can just grab the orange, move it up and down, play around. But by default you can probably leave this just exactly where it is. All right. Going through them one by one, it's saying that your bottom, let's look at that on the edge, the bottom of the cutting is dead on the top of the surface. All right. So it's detected that by itself. And then the top is up there. Top is a throwback to where you have different heights. You might have had a different height inside there if you set top to that. So to, to explain what I mean. If there was a feature that came up from here and you wanted to face everything here but not cut that feature, you would set this top lower than that feature and then it wouldn't it would ignore that feature. All right. For 99.999% of the time of what we do, you can just ignore that. All right. Uh, we've got to look at the passes now. So tolerance is how close to the model, how close to the shape of the model we want to cut. In this case, it's flat. It doesn't matter. Um, if it was curved, 
you it wouldn't be a facing operation. So it's a little bit silly that they got it in there. This is for curvatures. How close to the curvature do you want the tool to follow? In our case, not important. Had this thing been round or curved instead of a square, a little bit more important. Okay. Um, the past direction is, is it cutting from left to right, up or down when it's facing at zero degrees, I assume it's going to be up and down at 90 degrees would be left to right or 45 would be diagonally across the part. Uh, where that becomes important is if you're facing wood. If the majority of your grain is at roughly 30 degrees um, to your bed, you probably just want to set that to 30 degrees so you're facing along the grain of the wood so you don't, don't risk creating any chips or fractures in the wood. Um, the step over is how fine is it between parts? How finely is the cutter going to move across? Is it going to move in? It's a 10 millimeter cutter, so hypothetically you could come in five millimeter passes and you could cut this whole thing in like three seconds. However, for facing, go a little bit closer. They've put a what they recommend inside there. Put anything you want. Um, I'm going to put just for argument's sake, I'm going to put three millimeters in there. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to be really difficult. I'm going to, I'm going to put two. All right. Um, if you were facing and you had another operation to come in with another cleaner tool, you'd leave some stock. All right. So what this would do is it wouldn't cut right down to the bone. It wouldn't cut to that actual surface. It would calculate as if there was a bit of space between the surface and the other thing you wanted to do. In this case, we want to go right down to the surface. So let's leave that there. Um, there is linking. Just ignore this menu for now. It becomes more important when we start doing the multi-axis work. All right. So you can just click OK. Give that a couple of seconds to generate. So you can see what it's done is the tool, the blue line is the tool path. The tool is going to come down over here. It's going to move along that two millimeter. It's going to face it. All right. Don't get disturbed by the fact that it stopped there. The fact that it stopped there, it knows the tool is wider. There's no point cutting any further. The center of the tool is on the center of that blue line, which means that tool actually sticks out to about there somewhere. All right. Why it started out here, who knows, but it works. Okay. Um, <coughs> always as you're going along, always double check what you're doing. Two things happened automatically. You were given some stock to work with and it set a world coordinate system for you. Now let's talk a little bit about that before we move on. All right, because it thinks for you a little bit, but it may not always think the same thing you're thinking. So let's go up to that setup, double click it. All right, and let's have a look at what's in there. It is a milling operation, so that's correct. Orientation is, I'm using, in your, most of your case, you're going to use model orientation, but we have to select an origin point for it. Okay, and what that means is, where is zero? Okay. So we've set up some stock over here and you can see that it's up at the top of the stock. Okay, so let's put this back in a real world scenario. You're going to cut this thing out of a block of wood. You've measured the thickness of your stock. Your stock is 30 millimeters thick, all right, for example. And you're going to put on the table and you're going to cut down to it. This is where it becomes important to define how thick your stock is. All right. Is it relative to the size of the box you got in there, or is it a fixed size box? In the case of your plank, it's a fixed size box, and you type in the dimensions of your plank. All right. Then you've got a bit of stock. All right. If you went fixed size box, you would offset to the top, and the, uh, sorry, to the top and the sides as required. But at the bottom, you'd leave it on zero because zero, it's hard on your table. All right. Then the next consideration is, what is the setup? So I've got this bit of stock inside there that I'm going to cut down to. All right, my plank is thicker than the final part. But where am I going to zero the tool? Now, if your idea is you're going to bring the tool over to the table, touch it off on the table, call that zero, then it will write all the paths as Z positive. In other words, everything above zero is the model. But generally, most people look for the highest point on the model, and they will zero out over there. So in, in the case of your plank, if it's a little bit loopy-woopy and you're not sure what the thickness is, or it's a bit curved, or whatever issues you're having over there, find the spot that's the easiest for you to create a datum on. So if you put this plank down, and you don't know where the middle is because the plank's not exactly straight, and it's maybe that end is curved and it's too hard to find a middle, but you can find the bottom left, then select the bottom left. 
If, however, the majority of things we're going to be cutting, you can just take a caliper and divide your part in half. You can set the zero over there. Like I said before, if you're setting it to the table, you'd be selecting that bottom one over there, saying that that's my zero. Okay? Be careful, because setting it there means you have to actually touch off the probe on the table, and then in Mac, click Z0 while the tool is on the table, and then bring it over to start cutting. Okay, you still have to find the X and Y zero, but now it will cut up from zero, not the other way around. Most people use the top of the stock as the datum point because it's easy to bring your cutter over, move it down into the wood, and you drive it down with the, the page down key. And I do it like very slowly, and then I just roll the cutter to see when the cutter stops moving, I'm touching the wood. And then I know that I've hit my stock point, zero out Z, and we're ready to start cutting. All right, so that's a little bit about the stock thing that you have to be a little bit careful of. Okay, so always come in and double check what world coordinate system it assumed for you and make sure it's the same thing that you wanted. All right, it defaulted to that because the majority of people use that. Okay, all right, so that was um, how to do the facing and you can have a look at the tool path, but it's better to see what it's actually doing. All right. So that little grey boundary that you had up the top there, that's your hypothetical stock. We want to see how the tool moved through it, so we'll go to simulate. I right click that, I click on simulate. Uh, let's move that out a little bit. And you click the play button to simulate, and it's going to show you how the cutter is coming in. Now, do this just every now and then, just to see if the cutter is not doing something stupid, something you, you didn't anticipate. On a very simple tool path like this, it's not important. Can speed up the simulation over there all right um, and then let's have a look at I could actually have moved that over a little bit all right let's have a look at the next part of this and then chain those two simulations together all right now I want to have a bit of a discussion about tools and tool changing but we'll do that separate to this we're about to change tools in fusion so if we're okay with the facing thing, the name that you give it will actually show up in the text file. Oopsie, sorry, close it out. Will actually show up in the text file as a note, and it will show up in Mac. I like to give it a name so I can remember what tool I was meant to be using. All right. Now we're going to create a new operation to cut out everything through there with a three millimeter um, flat. All right, flat end mill. So I'm going to create a new operation in, in 2D. Hmm. 2D contouring. No, I'm going to use a 3D operation for this. And I'm going to use horizontal. So automatically detects all the flat areas of the part, clears them away with an offsetting path. All right. Offsetting means it will cut around the inside borders with an offset. In other CAM, they call this offset strategy. All right. So just they all just have a look at the picture that comes up when you highlight your mouse over it and see what looks the closest to what you're trying to achieve. In our case, we want to cut away all the horizontal surfaces, so I'm going to select that. Okay, I'm going to change tools now. I no longer want the three mil, so I'm going to go select a different tool. And I'm going to look for some three millimeter end mills in there. Three millimeter flat end mill. Chuck, chuck, chuck. Hmm, three millimeter bull nose, flat anvil. There we go. That's the one I want. All right, so you'll note that the tool's now a lot smaller. Um, then let's have a look through what we're doing again. You can select, I'm going to select plastics finishing. Those feeds and speeds seem a bit fast to me, but anyhow, we'll move along. All right, so the machining boundary. Where am I going to look for pockets? Remembering that this could be part of a much bigger part, and if you didn't specify it, it's going to search everywhere. So I'm going to say that I want to select my boundary as there. Only look for pockets inside of that boundary. All right. Now our finishing heights. This is the first time that top is important. We've already cut away the top. Okay, we don't want to cut the top anymore. So I'm going to just move this down. I'm going to look in the front view. <coughs> I'm going to move the top down to on the top of the model. Okay, because there's no point to cut that again. Bottom can be anywhere you like, as long as it's underneath the holes you want to cut. And these two are just your retraction. When it does quick moves between the cuts, how high does it move? And when it has to do very fast moves, 
from one side of the model to the other, how far through the gutter come up. That's what those two things are about. All right. Um, so let's have a look at that. I'm okay with everything we've got over there. What is the tolerance to the model? That's how tight. Now it's important because we're going inside of those curvatures of the three and the six and the zero. Is that tight enough? Have a look at your simulation if you see faceting. Put another zero in there, make it 0 0.02 as a good machining one, right? I want a manual step over inside there because I want to cut it very tight. So my maximum and minimum step overs. I want to make it 0 0.15. And 0 0.1. So in other words, what's the finest I can cut and what's the roughest I can cut? If you left that unticked, it'll try to automatically work out for you what it has to do. All right. Um, <coughs> we'll have a look at the two. I'll change them and see what they do. The last tab over here, the linking, you don't need to worry about for now. It falls under slightly more advanced. Let's click OK and see what we got. All right. So you can see it's busy calculating, and now we're done. So let's have a look at inside there. You can see the tool part's going to come in. It knows that it's a harder material, so it's doing a spiral down to the bottom, and then it's starting to cut from the inside outwards to finish that. Uh, you can look at those tool parts manually, or the easier thing to do is just let's simulate it. All right, so let's simulate that uh, on its own. And let's hurry it through to its end. Okay, so my manual step over had a lot of work. I saw it was really busy getting in there. So let's see if we can speed it up using their automated suggestions. So let's open the tool path again. All right, now let's look at their cutting. So turn off manual step over. All right, and let's click OK and see if this is any better. They might be more, oh, there's a lot more optimized. I see a lot less tool parts in there. Okay, let's have a look. See if that's better. Let's simulate it. Okay. So theirs is based on, they know how thick the tool is, so they've automatically set some step overs to allow the tool to do the least amount of work to get in there and actually clear this out, okay? Let's have a look. Looks good to me. All right, so now you're ready to get to the point where the whole thing looks good. So let's check the whole thing together. So you can do a simulate from the top down. So there's your bit of stock. Right click the setup and simulate everything together. All right, let's zoom that back a little bit. Let's click play. And then of course, speed up or slow down as required. Then I like to keep a visual look at what have I done and how am I expecting the machine to move? So that when you click the go button on the milling machine and it's not doing what you saw on the screen, you know something went wrong. All right. And that all appears to be good. Okay. So the last part of simulation is how it displays. Okay. So you can colorization by comparison is probably a fairly important one. All right. And I don't see, you can see it's showing you blue. This is where the tool, because it's got a three millimeter radius, couldn't get into that corner. All right, so it's showing you there's some of the original material left over there. Um, up to you then to decide, do I want to go to a smaller tool? Is this okay? Is it acceptable having a radius on the end like that? Okay, let's have a look at the other views you can have. You can see the color by operation or just see what the material looks like okay the very last thing we've got to do when we're done with all of this is we now have to post it now this is the the rest of this has been fairly easy the difficult part is the actual posting all right so when you go I want to write the NC program it's going to ask you for where is your post processor all right now you can pick from a system library I've got a personal local one for my machine set up at home think that most likely you can pick uh, Artsoft and Mac 3. All right. 
Uh, the only thing you've got to be careful of over here is don't use M6 for tool change and don't use G28 retracts. Right after everything there, it's all pretty good. All right. So you've got to go to operations. What do I want to post together? These two things. All right. Or do I only, because I've got to manually do a tool change, do I first want to do post the facing operation and then I'll load the horizontal operation as a separate thing? All right. So I'm going to put them both into one because Max can automatically stop between the two. All right. Oopsie. Big mistake. Use M6. Um, <coughs> sorry. With that ticked, when you go through here, it knows there's two different tools. So after it's finished facing, Mac will stop because we used M6 and it'll ask you to change tools before it moves to the next operation. So my apologies on the first instruction there. And you click post. All right, so it'll write a little file in the background. I always like to open the NC code, which I opened off screen. And have a look, that's not doing anything stupid. Um, you won't be comfortable reading this G code, but it's correct, all right? So we're saying <coughs> M5, turn the spindle off if it's on. Change to tool one, M6 command. Spindle on at 7,277 RPM set my um, my indexing system and now let's go all right so this is doing the cut all right so I will record the four axis one for you which believe it or not is actually far simpler than any than than any of the other two I've suggested so far so that looked long and it took a long time because I was explaining on my way through but really you created two operations a facing operation a horizontal operation and you cut everything you didn't have to go through selecting different surfaces or anything like that all right mate hope that was useful cheers